Okay, I'm not sure how much uh, synthesis, organic synthesis, you have encountered, but we're going to do a lot of synthesis this semester where we say, okay, here's a product we want to make. We want to make the product. How do we make the product? It turns out usually the best way, not always, but the best, often the best way of figuring out how to make the product isn't by saying, well, what reactions should I use? The best way of saying, okay, if this is the product I want to make, what reaction was the one that finally ended up making that final product? What two molecules did I need to react together to make that final product? And then you say, okay, now that I know two molecules that I can react together to make the final product, what two molecules do I react together to make those two molecules? For example, Say you wanted to make this. This is what you wanted to make. And you're looking at this, so, and so how do you make that? What reagents do you add together to make this thing? Well, the first thing you can say is, okay, well, oh, wait a minute here. I see something. I see a cyclohexene ring. I know how to make cyclohexenes. How do I make cyclohexenes? With a Diels-Alder reaction. I know that we're through Diels-Alder, I can make a cyclohexene. I also know that when I make my cyclohexene, this carbon, this carbon, this one, and this one are part of a conjugated diene, and these two are part of the dienophile, the double bond. So this bond and this bond are the two I need to make, but since we're going backwards, retrosynthetic analysis, those are the two that are what we call disconnects which means if I had a double bond, single bond, double bond here, or this molecule, and I see, okay, these two are, oh, they are opposite each other. One's coming out, one's going back. I know that comes from this molecule in the trans configuration. So through retrosynthetic analysis, I know that I can get this product through this, reacting this molecule and this molecule with Diels-Alder. So the next question is, how do I make this molecule? What, what step went in to make this molecule? What things made this molecule? How do I make this one? What step went into that molecule? So we'll do a lot more synthesis later, but uh, retrosynthetic analysis, a very good tool to say, okay, I recognize something in my product that I know how to make. What molecules must have come together to make that thing? And then go back a step. Okay, then what made those two molecules? And go back a step. Okay, what made those molecules? So you get to reagents you can buy. All right. So the last part of the chapter, there's uh, stuff about interesting um, molecules that, and uh, interesting things you can do with Diels-Alder, retro Diels-Alder reaction. Note steroid molecules. Steroid molecules have a general uh, formula. They kind of look like this. You tend to have a cyclohexane next to another cyclohexane with another cyclohexane and often a five-membered ring there. And so our steroid molecules, which include testosterone, progesterone, but also others such as cortisone, uh, it's related cortisol, cholesterol, these are, all have this structure of a six-membered ring, six-membered ring, six-membered ring, five-membered ring. They all have that structure. And we just learned through Diels-Alder how we can make six-membered rings. You take a diene, a dienophile, react them together, you can make six-membered rings. So there's a way to make a steroid-type molecule using Diels-Alder reactions to get these rings together. Okay. And the last part of this chapter is just a little UV viz. Okay, so I don't know if you know, if you remember too much molecular orbital theory, but let's take a look here. If you have ethene, CH2, CH2 here, double bonded together, uh, what we find is when we look at the molecular orbitals of this molecule, and recall way back when in Gen Chem 1 you did molecular orbitals, 
of molecules like H2. Do you remember that? When you had like H2, and so you put like, okay, H here, and H here, and H2 in the middle, and you had the 1s orbital here, and the 1s orbital here, and we said, okay, they form a bonding orbital here, a sigma bonding, and then we had a sigma star antibonding orbital, and each hydrogen has one electron, there's one electron here, one electron here, both electrons go down here, so two electrons in bonding molecular orbital, the bond order equals one, remember all that good fun stuff from Gen Chem 1, uh, the answer is I doubt it, but the truth of the matter is, a molecular orbital theory is one of the more interesting, kind of the, one of the harder things conceptual that you do in general chemistry. When you get to organic chemistry, it becomes even more difficult when you deal with bigger molecules than H2 and Cl2 and, and O2 and things like that. It gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, if you change your major to chemistry, your senior year in advanced in organic chemistry, you might get all the way to doing molecular orbital diagrams of carbon monoxide, CO, or maybe even carbon dioxide, CO2. And that's about as complicated as we want to get as an undergraduate. The thing to remember, though, is molecular orbital theory is where it's at. Molecular orbital theory just does a much better job of representing molecules and the transitions, the energies of electron movement in molecules much better than valence bond theory does. So although it's a much more complicated theory, it gives us much better answers. So sometimes we have to go with it. Yay, we have computers that can handle it. And so I don't really want to do the whole molecular orbital energy diagram for CH2 double bond CH2. It's too complicated. I don't even know how to draw it. However, I do know this because this is something you see in molecules. Note that pi bonds are not as stable as sigma bonds. That's something we learned before. Recall that a sigma bond, a carbon-carbon single bond is just a sigma bond. It's longer than a carbon-carbon double bond, but the double bond is not half the size. A double bond isn't, doesn't have twice the strength. A double bond is stronger than a single bond, but it's not twice as strong. Pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds. Another way of saying that, pi bonds, the orbitals involved in pi bonds, are less stable, are at higher energy than the orbitals involved in sigma bonds. Such that when you draw the whole molecular orbital energy diagram for CH2, double bond CH2, we can take one piece of it, the middle piece of it, if you're trying to draw the whole thing, it would be uh, crazy, there'd be orbitals here all over the place, and then the antibonding orbitals. We're just going to look at this middle part right here. This middle part of the molecular and orbital energy diagram. And what we find is when we look at the middle part, that these orbitals down here are all full, filled with electrons, up into this orbital right here, which is a pi orbital, a pi bonding orbital. The next orbital up in energy is a pi antibonding orbital, and it is unoccupied. It is empty. So in any molecule, in any organic molecule that has double bonds, what we find is the highest occupied molecular orbital, the molecular orbital that is at the highest energy but has electrons in it, the highest occupied molecular orbital, is a pi bonding orbital, and the next orbital up, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, is a pi antibonding molecular orbital. And so if you add the right amount of light, if you add the appropriate wavelength of light, you can get an electron to jump from the highest occupied molecular orbital up to the the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Get one of these electrons to jump up there. And that takes energy, and that energy for the most part is in the ultraviolet region. But 
What if you have a conjugated diene? What happens when you conjugate two dienes together? Turns out when you have a conjugated diene, you still have, well, now we've got two pi bonds, so we have two pi orbitals, and we have two pi antibonding orbitals up here. It turns out it still takes light in ultraviolet range to bump an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied. But when you have a conjugate double bond, this energy difference here is smaller than this energy difference here. So all this is, although this still takes ultraviolet light, it's at a longer wavelength, less energetic photon of ultraviolet light to do this than to do this. So what happens then if you took a conjugated diene like this? What if you had four double bonds conjugated together? Well, when you just had two double bonds conjugated together, the distance between the pi and the pi star orbital was this amount of energy. When you conjugate two more in, the energy gets even smaller. And in this molecule, we have the electrons here. Here it's filled to here with electrons. So the more pi bonds that you put together, the smaller the energy gap between those two pi orbitals, such that by the time you get to, say, around 11 pi bonds or so, 10 to 11 pi bonds conjugated together, by that time, the energy gap is so small that it's in the visible region. And so molecules that have a lot of pi bonding interaction or pi uh, bonds that are conjugated together, molecules with lots of pi bonds conjugated toge together tend to have color because finally we're in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum of where this delta E, this energy gap can be. Here's an example of a lycopene. This is the structure of lycopene right here. Check this out. As a, you know, this is not conjugated, but we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 conjugated double bonds here. And this is lycopene. It is the red pigment of tomatoes and watermelon and papaya and guava and pink grapefruit. That's what causes the color, that reddish color, in all of these things that we like to eat. It's this molecule lycopene that with 11 conjugated double bonds, it starts absorbing light in this region. When you shine light, visible light, on lycopene, photons in this region will cause the electron to jump from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is a pi to pi star jump, just like we saw here, a pi to pi star jump of that electron. And the molecule has color because that's now in the visible region. Cool. All right. And that is it for this chapter. Uh, we continue on to the next video when that gets posted. In the next video, we're going to start to look at benzene aromatic compounds. Uh, this next chapter we're about to start is actually quite short. Yay. But uh, fear not, the next chapter after that is a lot longer. So, see you at benzene.